Okay. Well, we're continuing on in the, uh, the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And God has some really relevant, important information for His people in these small books of the Bible. And this morning, um, we're going to be talking a little bit heavier than normal because of where we are in the Scripture here. Our text this morning, I was looking at a larger text, but I got stopped in two verses. So my sermon this morning is based on two verses in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And my message this morning is concerning hindrances to fellowship with God. And um, last week we touched a little bit upon... Uh, how John encouraged people to really open their heart up and, and be honest about where they are in their walk with Christ. And he, he said that there are people out there that claim to be believers, and in fact they're really not because they're walking perpetually in darkness and habitual sin, claiming to have fellowship with God, but in fact what's happening is they've never surrendered their heart, or we call our heart, um, our heart, it's not our heart, it's our spirit. They've never truly surrendered their spirit to the governance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, John, John had some things to say about this, saying, you know, if we claim to be in fellowship with God but walk in the darkness, we're not telling the truth to ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. Now, in the next part of this letter, John points out specific areas of sin that especially, I guess you could say, threaten our relationship with God. Now, a lot of, the, I mean, the world lives perpetually in this state, so we're going to talk about that. But worldliness is a great danger to the believer in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk some about this. Because it's so important that we understand the perspective of God when it comes to living life from day to day in the realm of this world. He created us. He knew what we would face. And He's given us the provisions not to be tilled under, but to be overcomers in this life in Him. And what He says in these two verses that are our text this morning is in John chapter 1, or 1 John, sorry, chapter 2. Yeah. 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. 17. We're going to stop at verse 16 for now. He says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So when John talks to us about not loving the world, okay, English is a very peculiar language. Love has so many different meanings, doesn't it? We use the word love for everything from I love my spouse to I love my best friend, I love my dog, I love my pizza. It's just thrown out there. Love is such a scattered word. When John speaks about not loving the world, he's not talking about loving the physical planet, nor is he talking about the people on this planet that God loves, as it says in John 3.16, that for God so loved the world. Okay, love not the world. It's not talking about that. John is referring, what he's referring to when he talks about the world in this context, he's referring to the system of the world that is filled with emptiness and evil that is pitted against God. He's referring to the world as the community of humanity that has united in its rebellion against the authority of God. So if in this sense, a person loves the world, and the world is what that individual lives for as their guiding principle in life, it shows that his spirit or her spirit has not been genuinely surrendered to Jesus. 
going back a few verses to the first chapter that we talked about last week, it shows that that person's spirit has not surrendered to Jesus. And in fact, he or she is not part of the family of God. You see, you can just go like this and you can pray the prayers and you can clutch your rosary. You can do all these things yet not know the Lord. You can be religious on the outside but dead on the inside. The spirit of a man or woman has been fiercely independent from God since the time of Adam and Eve. And the spirit of humanity without God's saving intervention, it always gravitates away from him to the things of this world. It's like a magnet. If you're not pursuing God and you're not walking closely with God, you will drift and the magnetism of worldliness will draw you in and will render you ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a travesty because we have a world out there that is dying that needs the message of the gospel so desperately. They need the church to shine like a light in the darkness. And we cannot afford to have a cover over our lives that keeps the light from shining out. There is hell to pay for disobedience to the Creator. And He's not willing that anyone should, should suffer that punishment. That's not His will. His will is to bring salvation to those who are lost. And His will is that His people bring His message to the lost in the power of His Spirit. And if that's the case, we have to run clear away from worldliness. Otherwise, we will not be effective. Who wants Christianity that is sour-faced, bitter, angry, and, per and, and, and compromising? Who in their right mind would want to saddle themselves with that kind of cement shoe. It really is. The Christianity that we put out there is the Christianity that people perceive. And if we're putting out there a Christianity that is not true to the principles of the Word of God, that is melded with worldly values, the system of this world rather than in Christ, to our detriment, the light that shines is not shining. And who wants that? I've had people tell me, why would I want Christianity? All I see is blah, 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 blah. Yes, sometimes there's people that have an excuse and they'll look to every excuse and they'll pick the one out of the hundreds and they'll use that as their excuse, as their escape. Sure, that's true. But what... there. The reason why John is preaching about or teaching about worldliness is because it is a temptation of the heart of a human being to wander from the living God. That spirit of man, fiercely independent from God since the time of Adam and Eve, is in us. Yes, it has been, it has been put down and we're no longer a slave to it and we don't have to listen to it. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature. That is true. But if we are not walking in the Spirit, if we're not walking in step with God, we're in grave danger of becoming worldly. We see an example of human history where people decided that they would do things the way that they wanted to do them and that they would make a name for themselves and that God could just be put over in the corner and they were going to make their life wonderful. They were going to build their life without reliance upon God. Now you guys know the story of the Great Flood. Most of you have heard of the story of Noah and the ark, right? And the Great Flood. We all know this. 
God decided to wipe the world clean because the people of the earth of that day had become exceedingly violent and the thoughts of most of the people, it said in the scriptures, were evil all of the time. Most of the people, their thoughts were evil all of the time. Noah, amongst the people in his generation, found favor with God. And as a result of that, God decided to save him and his entire family to repopulate the earth after he wiped it clean. So they took the animals onto the ark and the flood came and then they stepped out of the ark and they, re they, they began to establish human community back in the earth. The animals multiplied. Now they were all in the area around the mountains of Ararat, which is in modern day Turkey and, and that area down into the, what they call the Fertile Crescent the Euphrates and the Tigris River, that area in there, that was the first place where things started to happen again after the Great Flood because the, the Bible says that the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat. So that's where they started from. That's where all of ancient history comes from that cradle. Now, in Genesis 9-1, we read, God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So once they came out of the flood, God told them, Fill the earth. Have big families. Zemers aren't here this morning. They're, obe they're obeying the command of God. No, I'm just saying. If you want to have nine kids or ten kids, that's great. If you can afford that, that's, that's awesome. It's a, children are a blessing from God. So God asked Noah and his family um, to spread out and go throughout all the earth. Now Noah had three sons named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sadly, sadly, we see it right as soon as they get out of the ark, the stories, if you read the stories, that sin nature inherited from their great, 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 great grandfather Adam was very alive and well. And God recognized that. He even said after the flood, he says, from childhood, the inclination of people's hearts is evil all of the time. I'm not going to destroy the earth again like that, even though that's the case. Ham had a number of sons named Cush, or had a number of sons, and one of his sons was named Cush, I should say. And he, in turn, had a son named Nimrod. Nimrod is not a very wise guy. We all use that expression. Don't be that guy, you know. But Nimrod, at, in his day, was actually very popular. Nimrod was powerful. And um, he was also uh, a great hunter and known as a city builder. Amongst the things he did, he founded some of the greatest cities of the ancient world. He founded the cities of Nineveh and the city of Babylon. And we read in Genesis 11 that the people of his day Rather than go out into all the earth and spread around and repopulate the earth, they decided to gather themselves together to build a great city and to construct a great tower made of mud bricks that would reach into the heavens. Rather than filling the earth as God had commanded them, they wanted to construct a one world empire to stay put and to make a name for themselves in this world apart from God. We read in Genesis chapter 11, 4 to 9, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So, this is the case, right? So the Lord scattered them from there all over the planet. And they stopped building the city. And that is why it is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. So the people wanted to do their thing, but God recognized the inclination of their heart. And he recognized the inclination of a united people with eyes turned towards loving the things of this world rather than looking to God and loving God. 
would be a very dangerous thing, and it didn't fit into his plan for the world. God confused the people's languages, scattered them all over the world, and we see that that separation throughout the centuries has been very fixed. There's been people groups and language groups all over the world, and there's been a delay in the progression of the wickedness of mankind. Now, we know that there's been wickedness all the way from the beginning, for sure, but not in the same degree that would have happened if God would not have intervened. So now we know that we are in the last days. We know we're in the last days because what God interrupted just after the flood is what we see happening all over the world today. The world's been reunited under a common international language. English is spoken by most people in the world today. It's widely known as a means of communication to even tribes in Africa and to the far reaches of the world. And further to that, there's a push to unite the world under a single system of governance, just as there was just after the days of the flood. Only this time, God's going to let it run its course. Because the end is near, my friends. The end is near. God has a plan in play. From the beginning of time, he knew, he, he's not taken by surprise. He knew exactly how things were going to unfold. Further to that, you know, the gospel has gone to the four corners of the earth. There's, you know, and despite the fact that there's revival taking place in different places in the world, as a whole, the world of humanity is still in the same place as it was in the days of Nimrod. They're fiercely independent in united rebellion against the living God. And we can see the pressures of God, ungodly humanism throughout our culture, can't we? It's everywhere. In the Western world, there's been a cooling trend to, for many people pushing away from the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, pushing away from the church. And Jesus predicted that things were going to go this way. He says in Matthew 24, 12 to 14 in reference to the last times. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. We're at the end of the world. If you live in Israel, it takes many, many, many hours straight flying, 14, 15 hours of straight flight to get there. We are at the far reaches. Of, this prophecy has come to pass. We're living in it. All of this world's governments and technology advances may make us better off and more comfortable in our shoes here in the earth. I like air conditioning. You like air conditioning? Everybody likes air conditioning. That's a great technological advancement, isn't it? When the hot weather comes. So all these technology advances and these government systems can make us better off and more comfortable. I mean, we got security, you know. Oh, man. If I get injured, I get paid a check. If I lose a job, well, there's a social security network that I can, I don't have to worry about starving to death. You know? So there's advantages to these things, yes. But these things, they make, our, make us better off in the physical realm, but they do not make us better off because in falling in love with the things of this world, people push away from the source of life. People push away from the living God. Love for the world captivates a person and expresses itself through time spent, how people spend their time, through attention to what they put, put their attention towards, and through what they spend their money on through their expenses. And I, I want to say that that's the way of the world, right? And this actually becomes the territory of the casual Christian. Rather than focusing time, attention, and expense to further the kingdom of God, the carnal person in love with this world and what it offers builds his own kingdom with this world's comforts and pleasures at the center of all their priorities. Time, attention, expense is directed towards feeding self. 
and self-pleasure at the exclusion of investing in the establishment of the kingdom of God through the mission of his church. This is worldliness, folks. Concerning a worldly-minded person, we're told in Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. If we surrender ourselves to worldly thinking, we can obey God. We're not going to obey God because the two are in opposition. If a person becomes a believer and continues to struggle with their flesh, that person will be a weakling as a believer or at best, that's their best case scenario, or at worst may be deceived. A deceived person and actually an unbeliever thinking that they are a believer when they're not because their lifestyle denies the very existence of Christ in them. Just because you were baptized as a baby or maybe you said a prayer once at camp, doesn't make you a believer. If that prayer translates into allowing Christ to take over your heart, then yes, it does. But some people don't, they don't actually surrender. They just, they pray their prayers like a mantra. It's like, I've said it before, it's like fire insurance. There's no intention to surrender to God. Self is at the center This is just an add-on to give me some benefit. Christianity is all about what I can get out of it rather than recognizing who I am before a holy God and having the fear of the Lord, which, by the way, is the beginning of wisdom. I'm fiercely independent. I do things my own way. My Christianity is at my own convenience and the way that I want it. Well, the Bible says that if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. That means surrender, folks. In verse 16 of our text this morning, the Apostle John says that the fierce spirit of human independence and rebellion against the authority of God, which we're defining this morning as love for the world, is displayed and manifested through people in three different ways. I'm going to talk about three different ways. The first thing that John mentions is through this independent rebellion is manifested through the lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. Our sin nature dominates the sinner, right? Before you're a believer, the sin nature dominates you because that's what's alive in you. The spirit has not made its home in your heart, so therefore, you're part of the kingdom of this world. Your heart is dead because of sin. Now, we know that as believers, sometimes we still struggle with that old nature. Our sinful nature, dominated by sin and rebellion, is so closely tied to the physical aspect of mankind that it is called the flesh. Every human being is born of the flesh. Every human being is born of the union between a man and a woman that produces another flesh-bound human. Desires that arise from being fleshly creatures in a fallen world can quickly become sinful lusts. The lust of the flesh is the appetite within the nature of a person for the sins of the flesh. Worldly ambitions are selfish aims. Lusts of the flesh... In flame. They excite the pleasures of the flesh to the abandonment of God at the center. For instance, I'm going to talk about a couple of these things. There's more than one, there's more than two, there's more than three. There's all kinds of different lusts of the flesh. Let's talk about eating. Eating to satisfy hunger is not wrong. It's not wrong to enjoy good tasting food. I enjoy a great barbecue. Barbecued T-bone steak, it's right up there. Especially if it's accompanied by prawns, right? And a nice Caesar salad on the side. Mmm, that's great. 
Mushrooms, yeah, mushrooms. Garlic mushrooms. It's not wrong to enjoy good tasting food, folks. It's, it's only wrong when the food becomes our God replacement. Because we derive, when we start deriving our comfort and purpose in life, living to eat, it becomes a higher priority than our relationship with God. Now, food was given to us as a beautiful gift from the Lord. Beautiful tasting gift. Wonderful. God could have just, you know, put like a lid on top of our heads where we just go and dump in some stuff, whatever. Right? He could have done that. He didn't do that. He gave us taste buds. He gave us senses. Beautiful. What a gift. But food can become too important to us. It can become such a controlling part of a person's life that it controls everything. Eating becomes a top priority over everything else. And the result is that people hoard food. Gain excessive weight. I mean, I'm speaking myself. Everybody has this struggle in this culture particularly because it's so abundant, right? The result is when we give ourselves over to it, to this lust of the flesh. We become, unhel- we become unhealthy, undisciplined, and prone to disease. There's consequences to our decisions. It wastes our resources that could be used elsewhere to God's glory. The Romans used to um, indulge in banquets and then go to their lavatory and uh, throw up and go back for more. Gluttony, that's where that kind of thought comes from, right? So they just so enjoyed the pleasure of eating that that's, they just wasted it. And meanwhile, there's people starving down the street from them. And, and as Christians, it, it, this, this sin disables us from being able to effectively steward the gifts that God has given us to use for him. And I'm talking stewards of our physical gifts, because if I'm not healthy, I can't do anything. I can't use the gifts that I've been given, right? Things that I should, I mean, maybe I should be, you know, helping another person who's hungry. That keeps me from doing that. Gluttony is a lust of the flesh, and it's not pleasing to the Lord. It's a sin which, when pursued, demonstrates a love for the things of this world more than a love for Christ. And I know that this is not a popular subject because there's so much problem with this. But it is what it is. This is the word of God, people. We've got to face these issues head on. We can't just say, oh, that's just the way it is. That's the way I am. No. You can change with God's spirit in you. You don't have to be a slave to your sin nature any longer. You have choice. God's given you everything you need for life and for godliness in him. If we are struggling in this area, we need to take mastery over this. We need to surrender ourselves to Christ in this area. When we do, the result will be freedom. Deliverance from gluttony will positively impact our health, our energy, and our ability to do things. It will enhance our relationship with God, our mission to love and care for others around us as well. And and I'm not going to stop with that because there's other lusts of the flesh. I just thought I'd mention that because it's a major one. The same can be said of sexual lusts. We desire food, water, shelter, sex, and comfort. That's how God made us. He created us with these desires. And when he created us, he says, it's good. God created us as sexual beings. Both sexual desires and the sexual desires uh, between a man and a woman within the confines of the marriage vow can be a very beautiful and pleasurable addition to life. For certain it is. In the New Testament, Jesus taught that all sexual relationships outside of the marriage vow are immoral. Sadly, this world is broken. It's broken so badly because of immorality. 
just look around us at the brokenness of our society. Perversity and human sexuality, rather than bringing freedom, actually leads people into chains of bondage, depression, sorrow. The consequences are so grave for immoral behavior. People are hurt and degraded more than they're enhanced. Sexuality by God was meant to be an enhancer of life, not a degrader of life. The problem comes when satisfaction of the lust of our flesh becomes more important to us than pleasing God or caring for other people. That's the bottom line. Sexually immoral behavior at its root is self-centered behavior. Out of its proper context, our sexuality can become a great source of harm to both ourselves and other people. And um, I found a quote here, and I thought it was terrific. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read this quote to you. I don't normally read this much of a quote, but this is really good. And it's, it really hits the nail on the head. As to, people ask, why can't I just do what I want sexually? Why can't I do? Okay, well, C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, has, has, a, has a quote, and, and I want to share it with you. He's talking about Christian marriage and sexuality. He puts it this way. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and a wife are to be regarded as a single organism. For that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. The two, one, right? And the Christians believe that when he said this, he was not just expressing a sentiment, but was stating a fact just as one is stating a fact when one says that a lock and a key are one mechanism, or that a violin and a bow are one musical instrument. The inventor of the human machine was telling us by its two halves, the male and the female were made to be combined together in pairs, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. Now get this, okay? He, was ma he made human relationships between man and woman to become one person together. Togetherness. The monstrosity of sexual intercourse outside of marriage is that those who indulge in it are trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual union, from all the other kinds of union which were intended to go along with it and make up the total union. Following this? The Christian attitude does not mean that there is anything wrong about sexual pleasure any more than about the pleasure of eating. It means that you must not isolate that pleasure and try to get it by itself any more than you ought to try and get pleasure of taste without swallowing and digesting by chewing things and spitting them out. Does that make sense? I thought, I read that, I'm like, the whole gluttony thing with the Romans? Sexual immorality on a, on, a, uh, on a lust of the flesh level is the same as eating your food and going to the lavatory and throwing it up and going back for more. It's on the same level. It was not intended that way. God did not intend us to be broken in that manner. And when we go off and we do whatever we want in the lust of the flesh, the consequences are, are horrific. Our eyes. So that was, that's the lust of the flesh. It connects very closely with the lust of the eyes. So let's talk about the second way that John describes love for the world through the lust of the eyes. Our eyes were created to see the spectrum of colors and shapes of created things. Aren't you glad for that? If you have a trouble with your vision, man, that is really a hard thing to overcome. I've talked to people that have lost their vision or who are losing their vision, and it is a big deal. It is a huge deal because our eyes were created to see the spectrum of colors and shapes of created things. And the desire for material things and the beauty of material things is a gift from God. Definitely is. God is a master artist and the human beings who were made in the image of God are also artistic and we do appreciate things that look good, don't we? Our great-grandmother Eve, we're told, she looked at the forbidden fruit and when she looked at it, she saw what she see? She saw that it was pleasing to the eye. 
and it appeared to be beneficial in obtaining wisdom. And that, that fruit, when she looked at it, it, it appealed to her artistic sense. It's one thing to notice how something looks appealing and quite another to let ourselves become enamored by it and wrongfully take it in, indulge it into our senses. In other words, worship it. The lust of the eyes leads us to love the wrong things. For example, when used the right way, money and material goods can do much good in this world and and they can enhance the enjoyment of our lives, can't they? That's a gift from the Lord, folks. We can all appreciate the appearance of something well-designed or nice. Now, I, I can appreciate, you know, when I go to a car show, you know, those car shows where they open the hoods on all the old classic cars and someone has meticulously polished and made that thing hum, you know, it's like, you know, and it's just perfectly tuned and chrome rims, nice paint job. Wow, that's something to behold. Wow. We can all appreciate the appearance of something well-designed or nice. But if my heart begins to covet that car and I start to obsess over having a car like that or one better than that, and I'm convinced in myself that my life will not be good until I can get that one or I can get one like that, this is where I begin to have a problem. When I yield to the temptation of the lust of the eyes, I think that material things or what appear to be things of beauty and quality are going to make my life worthwhile. That's where my life turns. As a Christian, when it comes down to it though, if I lust for something with my eyes, and even as non-Christians, okay, I can't get no satisfaction. You know? Young kids probably don't understand that. Mr. Rolling Stones guy wrote that, right? Um, It's true. If I lust for something with my eyes, when I wind up getting it, what's the result? Am I going to be satisfied with that? No. I just looked on a website talking about the top 30 houses or something that celebrities own and all these lavish mansions and they're competing with one another for ooh, the nicest, you know, 25, 30 bedroom home. Like, are they satisfied? I can't get no satisfaction out of the things of this world, people. You will not gain satisfaction in the things of this world. So when you look at something with your eyes and you think, I need that and it's going to make me happy if I get it, don't give in to the liar. That is the lust of the eyes manifesting. You see, when I lust for something with my eyes and I wind up getting it, I'm not going to be satisfied. The goalposts are going to move and I'm just going to desire more. And that's why Paul says to Timothy, Pastor Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 11, he writes this, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You hear that? So when I'm bound by the spiritual chain of the lust of the eyes, Godliness with contentment is not even a consideration. The scripture tells us the root of many kinds of evil is the love of money. Love for money and material possessions, power, success, it might have pleasant outward appearances, but the reality is that these kind of things, as a believer, if I let my eyes wander to these things that those people have or these things that I think I will need to be satisfied, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to get deceived. I'm going to end up with a heartache. I might even end up wandering from the faith when I give way to this. I will, actually. Money and possessing beautiful quality things in this world never satisfies the soul. Some of the wealthiest persons in the world, you know this. 
with the nicest cars, the nicest houses, the nicest diamond rings, the nicest clothing, the nicest looking faces with their plastic surgery. They're the most miserable people in the world, some of these people. And I should say that the lust of the eyes is not restricted uh, solely to rich people. Some of the poorest people on this planet fall prey to the sin as well and they become material hoarders for whatever they can get their hands on. Everything is collected. Nothing is discarded because my security in life has become fixed upon what my eyes behold. The spirit bound by the lust of the eyes can see nothing without wishing to acquire it and will delight to flaunt it if it is acquired. That's the spirit of the lust of the flesh or lust of the eyes. Some people aren't happy unless they're always buying something new. Desire for more will bring me satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Remember that next time this temptation comes your way. Do you really need that? Probably not. Maybe you do. Maybe it'd be something God sometimes gives us the desires of our heart. Sometimes he allows us to enjoy something that we want. But that should not dominate my, my, my focus. And if it does, it's going to hurt me. It says here, they're gonna, it's, you're going to pierce yourselves with many griefs. Who wants to be pierced with more griefs than they've already had in life? Yay, me. No, you don't want that. Neither do I. So let's listen to the Word of God. The Word of God is wisdom. It is truth. I have advice to some people here today that may be struggling with a sin. Hebrews 13.5 says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Isn't that an incredible promise? We have it all. When you have Jesus in your spirit... You have what you need. And it doesn't matter what you don't have in this physical realm. You are rich beyond comprehension. Oh God, help us not to covet, not to place value on, how, on what we own or how we look, but rather help us, Lord, to focus on a, the eternal nature of life. And you're calling for me to submit to you and to be glorifying of you for your kingdom's sake, O oh God, that others might come to know the truth that would set them free from the chains of the oppressor, the God of this world. And Lord, help us to get our eyes onto you. The third way John describes the love for the world is through the pride of life. The Greek word for the pride of life Pride in this place here is a lasagna. No, I'm not talking about the tasty Italian dish. Lasagna, right? A lasagna is pride. It is the pride attitude of a man when he lays claim to possessions and achievements in order to exalt himself because his self esteem is measured by appearances. Pride. In other words, the pride of life referred here to, uh, referred here by the Apostle John is what we could ter- term um, vain ambition. It's the thirst that a person sometimes has for honor and applause from others to bolster your self-esteem. There's a lot of talk about increasing your self-esteem. I think a lot of self-esteem would increase if we turned our eyes off of ourselves and onto God. Christians, you have poor self-esteem, turn your eyes to Jesus. He'll give you what you need. He'll show you who you are in Him and the value that you have to Him. Your self-esteem will raise when you turn your eyes to the Lord. The world has this other idea, right? Galatians 5, 29 to 21, the Apostle Paul speaks to what John refers to as all three of these things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. See, If we're looking to self-raise, we're thinking about self. All our focus is on self. You see that scripture that I, I expressed to you earlier in the sermon? 
if you want to gain your life, you need to lose it. You don't need to grab it harder. You lose your life for Christ's sake and give your life to Christ and His mission and you will find life. That life will be abundant and overflowing. Paul says in Galatians 5, 29, or sorry, 19 to 21, the acts of the flesh are obvious. So we'll start with the lust of the eyes, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. And I've always used to wonder why those things were coupled with this. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions, and envy. And then he goes, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that's because this encompasses these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The pride of life encompasses hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. The pride of life is the root cause of strife in families. It's the root cause of strife in churches. It's the root cause of strife in nations. It exalts self in direct contradiction to Jesus' statement that those who would follow him must take up their cross. And by the way, that's an instrument of death and deny themselves prior to following him. There's nothing at all wrong with taking pleasure and a sense of pride in doing a good job at something. If you're an employer, you always like your employees to, to have a sense of pride in the way that they carry themselves in their work. You know, rather than, oh, good enough. Sweep that under the rug, you know. Good enough. No. Excellence is not a bad thing. And taking that kind of pride in, in, in doing your very best with the stewardship of your life is very good. And Christians, we are an example to the world out there. So if you're an employer or you're an employee, be an example of faith and serve your employer well. When you put your hand to the plow, plow well. Don't just sweep things under the carpet. Don't do just the bare minimum so you can get your paycheck and go home. You are a steward of your life. God has given that to you as a gift. Do it well. That's not what I'm talking about, taking pride in that. Pride of life goes beyond taking pleasure in accomplishments. It worships self-accomplishment. The pride of life is the sin of being arrogant or boastful about what we have or what we have achieved. And it's also the sin of seeing others as inferior on our account due to our wonderful achievements, personality, how we look, or our status. Am I looking at myself as better than the next person because of the way I look, because I'm more famous, because I'm more talented, because I have a position of power that they don't have? Um, is that how I view it? If I do, I need to repent. God, forgive me. Help me to have a humble attitude and to consider others better than myself. The pride of life refers, you know, to hunting after honors, titles, pedigrees, boasting of ancestry, family uh, connections, great offices of power and prestige, acquaintances. I, I know this person. I know that person. I'm important. That kind of mentality. This is the pride of life. The pride of life refers, now John Wesley, hundreds of years ago, said this. He said, um, the pride of life refers to all that pomp and this is not, not in modern English, but you catch it. The pride of life refers to all that pomp in clothes, houses, furniture, equipage, manner of living which generally procure honor from the bulk of mankind and so gratify pride and vanity. You see what he's saying? And, and today, Christians sometimes can be puffed up and feel too big on account of what is possessed or what is accomplished and um, maybe achievements are at the forefront of conversation making it sound like they've done it all themselves 
without God or making others feel inferior to them because of their religious or political position or their level of education. You know, as Christian brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to treat everybody the same. And that means treat your pastor the same way as you treat the hobo who wanders into this church. That means when you consider your dinner plans, consider the people that need fellowship, not just the people that you like because they jive with what you stand for. Doesn't the Bible say this? Be willing to associate with all kinds of people? Folks, this is a reality check in the North American church. Ah, ouch. I look at myself and I see the pride in my life. Maybe you're looking at yourself and you're seeing the pride in your life too. It's time for us to, to say, Lord, help me to be humble. Give me grace, Lord, to be like you, Jesus. See, the pride of life was the very sin that resulted in Satan's expulsion from heaven. With all of his giftings, talents, and abilities, Satan was not content just to be a servant of God. Satan desired to be God, and that was his downfall. You see, really when we embrace the pride of life, we're expressing a desire to, to take over God's place. And that's where the great sin is. Pride comes before a fall. It always does. God will not let us get away with this. If we decide that we're going to follow this pattern of life, get ready for discipline. Because <laughs> it's coming. And it might not be so pleasant. But God loves you. He loves me and He's not going to let us just steer our ship into that gener direction and let us continue. He's going to run interference. We should be concerned if we can just do whatever we want and there's no discipline. God loves us and as His children... He disciplines us when we need it. Because what the bottom line is this, with regards to all these lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life, nothing in this realm that we're seeing right here is lasting outside of God's eternal plan. Nothing's lasting. It doesn't matter at the end of the day what position you hold what kind of machinery you own or what kind of boat you have or what kind of car you drive or what kind of house you live in. None of that's going to matter. Every person that I've been with when they passed away has been either in their bed at home, on the side of a road, or in a hospital. And there's nothing they can do to stop what's ta taking place. You step into eternity as naked as you were on the day you were born. The only thing that matters is what you've done with Jesus. What you've done in this world for God. The things of this world pass away, but the Lord's word is everlasting. And eternal life belongs to those who believe. Eternal life is something to look forward to. See, the Apostle John ends with this, and I'll end with this too. The, word, the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. What a promise. Eternal life. And, and the deposits here now in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The life-giving Spirit. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your amazing love. We thank you that despite the fact we are sinners, you still died for us. God, you sent our rescue in our direction even though we didn't deserve it. Thank you for that, Lord. God, may we not be frivolous in how we carry ourselves, but in return for this great love and mercy that you've shown us. Lord, help our hearts to be turned toward you. May you... You glorify yourself in our lives, through our lives, through the various giftings that are amongst your people here today, Lord. Glorify yourself in my life. Glorify yourself in the life of your church and the people of, are the church. 
Thank you, Lord, for this day. You are so good to us. We praise you for your promises. And we also thank you for the warnings to steer clear of things so that we can live effectively and productively for you. We pray that you'd help us, God, because we are weak, but you are strong. Forgive us, Lord, for the things we need forgiveness of. Strengthen us for the things we need strengthening for. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.